for eukaryotes. And because of that, it costs two ATP for eukaryotes. Right? If you're a bacterial cell in your cytoplasm, you make the pyruvates, and you got the electrons and hydrogens, right? And then you go right along and you do your Krebs cycles. But for eukaryotes, they have to get these ingredients into the mitochondria to do the Krebs cycle. So being they have to transport all that stuff into the mitochondria, it costs them energy to do so. And that costs them two ATP. So that's why eukaryotes only get 36 ATP per molecule of glucose, and bacteria get 38. And at that, 36, 38, that's less than 40% efficient. Where's the rest of the energy go? Remember body heat? So the rest of the energy is lost is body heat. But it's not really a loss, because you need the body heat to keep your enzymes working. Even bacteria, they'll literally, the colony will be warmer when they're metabolizing and actively growing. If they're dead, kind of like people, they're literally cooler. Okay, third step, I call it oxidative phosphorylation. Let's just talk about that word. Oxidative refers to, look here, oxidation, oxidation. Oxidation. We broke bonds in our glucose and got electrons and hydrogens. That's the energy from the bonds. We're going to gather up all the electrons and hydrogens from all those oxidation reactions. And what are we going to use them for? We're going to use them to make ATP from ADP. Let's try a different color for that. Remember our ATP, ADP cycle? ADP to ATP, right? If I add a phosphate, I'm going to have to make a new bond. So this requires energy, right? So the E's and H's don't literally go in there themselves, but they create the energy to build that bond. Later, when I'm doing building reactions, I can break off the P, release the energy from the phosphate bond, I return to ADP, and I had to pluck off my phosphate. And when I did that, energy was released from the phosphate bond. So all those oxidations provide the energy to do the phosphorylation. This is phosphorylation. That's why it's called oxidative phosphorylation. Now, I've read a variety of microbiology textbooks in my day, and they all explain it a little differently. But for me, that's the simplest way to understand it. Okay? Oxidative phosphorylation means I did all these oxidations when I broke the bonds in my glucose molecule, and now I'm going to gather up all the electrons and hydrogens that were released from those oxidations and package that energy in a phosphate bond to make ATP. Right? Okay. Where does it happen? At the electron transport chain. Remember, plasma membrane and membranous organelles are phospholipid bilayers with proteins interspersed. Some of the proteins are the proteins of the electron transport chain. Okay? So, the electrons and hydrogens are literally going to be carried to the membrane. See, there's a membrane inside the mitochondria. Remember mitochondria? Here's a little mitochondrion, right? It's got membrane around the outside, and then it's got squiggles of membrane on the inside. The electrons and hydrogens are literally going to be added to the membrane. They're going to go into the membrane and go across the membrane. In a bacterial cell, it's going to go 
Make a nice big bacterial cell. Plasma membrane, cell wall, nucleoid. Here happens your glycolysis. Your Krebs cycle is next. And all the electrons and hydrogens. Right? What do you get? E's, H's, E's, H's. You even got from the transitional step, right? And they're all literal, literally going to go into this membrane. And they're going to tumble, because remember, the membrane is actually a um, phospholipid bilayer. And it's going to have proteins throughout. Much prettier pictures in your textbook. And the PowerPoints we sped through yesterday. <laughs> All right. Here's one chunk of the membrane. <coughs> that might have a complete electron transport system chain right there. And then the next chunk of membrane might have another one. And so there's more than one electron transport chain. They run throughout the membrane. We're just going to look at one at a time. And what happens? These electrons get passed through the membrane. The reason is because those membrane proteins are called cytochromes, which means they contain iron. You know why iron rusts? Because it's doing all that chemical activity with electrons. Electrons are attracted to them. So the electron's going to be attracted to this membrane protein first, and then it's going to be even more attracted to this membrane protein and then it's even more attracted to this membrane protein and that membrane protein. And as the electrons travel through the proteins of the membrane, the hydrogens follow them. The hydrogens, however, are, don't have an affinity for the cytochromes. Instead, the hydrogens are going to get kicked out. So I'm trying to put E's in here. And the hydrogens literally get kicked out to the space between the plasma membrane and the cell wall. There's a way to actually calculate your oxidations and your carrier molecules. Electrons and hydrogens that are carried by NAD, you get three ATP. The ones that are carried by FAD, you only get two ATP. I don't care about all that. Just need to know all these hydrogens are going to get kicked across the membrane. What did I just set up? A concentration gradient, right? Before I had an accumulation of hydrogens over here, when they follow the electrons and get pushed out to this space, now I have accumulation of hydrogens out here. And that's going to create a concentration gradient. And if you had any introductory biology, you would know systems like equilibrium. Remember, one of the jobs of the plasma membrane is to maintain equilibrium on both sides of the membrane. This is not equilibrium. So what happens is all the H's come rushing back in. Meanwhile, the electrons got bounced through the membrane, and they eventually come back in. And guess who's waiting to have them? Oxygen. Oxygen is an electron hog. Just remember that. Oxygen's an electron. <coughs> so all the electrons are attracted to oxygen. And all the hydrogens are attracted to electrons. So all the hydrogens now go to the oxygens. And what happens? I add oxidation, oxidation, oxidation. And I told you before that redox reactions means reductions are coupled to oxidations. This is my reduction. The oxygen gains all these hydrogens, and it gets reduced. So this is your reduction to water. And if you look at the chemical formulas, it's more than one molecule of water. It's six. All right. Now, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, yes. This flow of the hydrogens creates energy. 
So all of this energy is harvested. That's what this is. This energy is used to make ATP. So after you break down your glucose all the way, you get water. Every time you do a decarboxylation, you get carbon dioxide. You break off that carbon. Carbon likes to make bonds. Remember, carbon wants four bonds. Got a bond to somebody, bonds to oxygen. So whenever you see a decarboxylation, whenever you see a carbon plucked off, it's going to be released as carbon dioxide. So here's decarboxylation, <coughs> here's the carbon dioxide coming out. So now go back to those formulas. You start with glucose, you add oxygen, you break your glucose apart completely, you get water, carbon dioxide, and ATP. 36 ATP per molecule of glucose. And it's not 100% efficient, the rest of the energy is lost as heat. Metabolic heat. When you're metabolizing, you warm up body heat. Okay, I think that's correlation on electron transport chain. Uh -huh. Okay. <coughs> so after time cycle, glycolysis uh, dissolves electrons from hydrogen to go to membrane, right? Yep. Spiral membrane. Electrons, they pass 